If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Reading the New Testament through the lens of Judaism nowadays, I can't help but see Jesus as a star player of the Roman agenda. Uh, verses such as Matthew 21, 43, I tell you God's kingdom will be taken from you and given to the people who will do what he demands. John eleven forty eight. 48, then the Romans will come and destroy our temple and our nation. Matthew 3, 11, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In these verses, I detect the message of pride for Roman power and destruction. Replacing the Jews, the Holy Spirit, as the will of Titus and the Flavians, uh, with fire burning the temple, and Jesus as a completely fictive person in the appearance of a Jew preaching that Roman agenda in a hidden kind of way. The agenda goes hand in hand with the doings of Titus in 70 AD, who clearly brought that sword and baptized with fire, loads of it. Uh, reading the war on the Jews, we have descriptions of Titus as Roman troops running about among the clouds like heroes, clouds as in smoke from the fire they started. It sounds kind of like the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory and many more familiar writings. So my question, was Jesus the fictive alter ego of Titus making himself a Roman man God? And what should make me believe that Jesus ever even existed at all? So that's the first question. And then uh, the last is short. It's, is the NT perhaps partially written by the same author as War of the Jews, Flavius Josephus? The Christian Bible, with the exception of the book of Revelation, the last book, is very pro-Roman, very. And frankly, I'm surprised you didn't point to other verses that are more explicitly pro-Roman. In fact, in, in Paul's view, the Roman Empire was placed there by God and it is forbidden to rebel against it. And if you rebel against the Roman Empire, you are rebelling against God. That's in Romans chapter 13. That's how it begins. The Christian Bible is very pro the empire. Pontius Pilate is completely exonerated for Jesus' crucifixion, and the Jews are uniquely held accountable for killing Jesus, explicitly. And in fact, uh, the later the books, chronologically, the more anti-Jewish they are. That means the book of John is far more anti-Jewish than the book of Mark. And the book of Mark is very anti-Jewish. So that's quite a, a high bar to pass through. The Christian Bible is very pro-Roman. Pontius Pilate is portrayed and characterized as utterly not responsible for Jesus' death. We are introduced to Pontius Pilate's wife. She makes a cameo in one chapter in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, and that's Matthew 27, and she has a dream in that Jesus is innocent, and she says exactly that. And while the Pontius Pilate and his wife see Jesus as innocent, the Jews are screaming for Jesus' crucifixion and uh, for to free Barabbas. And the Jews take his uh, blood upon ourselves and our children. Explicitly, it's in Matthew 27, verse 25. So the Christian Bible is fiercely pro-Roman, loves the empire, adores the empire. The Jews are the villains at every turn. I have to say that I grew up as a child hating Christians, as a very young child. And when I read the Christian Bible, I realized why they hate me so much. And then I met nice Christians, which made me think. And now I realize that the fact that Christians don't kill every Jew they see on the streets is a testimony to how nice they are 
given the literature they're exposed to. However, in Europe, not many Christians study their own Bible, thankfully. It's mind-blowing that there should have ever been a nice Christian, meaning a pro-Jewish Christian, because the books are so violent in their hatred for the Jews. I mean, I've read Mein Kampf more times than I wish I had to. It's like that. Worse, because it's, it's filled with s storytelling. If you want to make a bigot, tell stories. I can, I can make anyone into a bigot, and it doesn't matter what race you want to demonize. Just tell stories how only that group does this and ignore everything else, and you'll produce bigots every time. So the Christian Bible, in a sense, is more akin not to Mein Kampf, but to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, an early 20th century screed produced by the czar, the secret police for the czar. It's thoroughly pro-Roman. In fact, the um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church has a tradition that Pontius Pilate uh, repented and committed suicide, and they regard him as a saint. And this is not a weird group. This is a member of the Orthodox Church. Why? Because if you read the text, Jesus literally in John 19 says to Pontius Pilate that the ones, you don't even know what you're doing. It's those that gay handed me over to you, their sin is greater. It's all ridiculous because if Jesus is supposed to die for the sins of the world, then the Jews really facilitated a religion. So Christians should really find every Jew they could encounter and thank them repeatedly for killing Jesus so that we would have a religion. It's really so nonsensical. But when you read the Christian Bible, you can't help but hate the Jews. And, and that there should be any Christian that doesn't feel this way is mind-blowing. That's how. Now, um, there are theories by scholars that the author that the book of Luke is really much later than we had thought. I don't want to go into this, or I'll be on for hours. But Luke is typically dated in the mid 80s, about the time of Matthew. However, it appears that the author of the third gospel is using uh, Josephus's works. And therefore, there are scholars today that think that the book of Luke and Acts are really second century. That's not the consensus, but there is a thinking that way. Um, what is my view? I'm not sure. It's, um, it's a very intriguing uh, argument, very intriguing. You asked about oh, the son of one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. So that really comes from the Hebrew Bible, and that's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Uh, that is talking about Mashiach. And why does it why is Mashiach called the Son of Man? Why? Think. Because all the gods of the ancient world were born to virgins. So Tanakh wants you to know that no, he's not born a virgin. He's a son of a man. He has a daddy. Son of man in Tanakh means he's human and not divine because virgin birth were assigned to all the great men of antiquity, you know, including Alexander the Great and so on, very famously. So... That's it. Now, your final question was, do I think Jesus existed at all? I think, so this is a, a, a subject in the area of humanities. This is not um, a hard science. It's very different. You know, there's, it's not like, you know, I could advance an idea in, in physics or math and 
and then it can be replicated. History can't be replicated. Okay? And that's incidentally why views about the relationship between Josephus and Luke and references to Jesus in Josephus, that's why the consensus, the pendulum, the pendulum of views among scholars just swings every 40 years. Why does it swing? It's because this is humanities. This is not hard science. This is not, like every uh, doctor knows that smoking is a very bad thing to do to your body. <laughs> and if a doctor ever said that it's a good thing, it's healthy to smoke, he would lose his license to practice medicine. Okay, so uh, all right. So it is, I think, more likely than not likely that he exists. I think it's very likely that there was some person, probably from Nazareth, because it's hard to imagine why someone would come up with Nazareth. So this is a strong speculation, but who probably was wound up getting crucified. And when you study geometry, that's a hard science, the first thing you learn about are postulates, things that you accept without evidence. So, and it's from those postulates, those axioms, that theorems could be developed. If two sides of a triangle are equal, their opposite angles of their opposite angles are equal. You could demonstrate that. And this must bring back memories from going to high school. So you have to assume some things. You don't have to. So if we assume that there's just some Jew got crucified, we know hundreds of thousands of Jews were crucified in the first century. We know that from historians. We know that. And there was basically only one reason why you'd get crucified, and that's because you committed an act of treason against the empire. They wanted to make an example out of you. It was a very expensive, tedious, complicated way to execute somebody. So we probably, you know, so he got himself in a lot of trouble with the empire. He he didn't rob a bank. And I think like this is a little complicated, but why does Matthew and Luke each have infancy narratives that are trying to have Jesus born in Bethlehem. And I say trying to because they each, each use a very different story or a very different plot device to make that happen. Like why? So why don't they, like why are they working so hard? But they need to get him back to Nazareth. That's the key. They each have a way of doing it. In Luke, they always were from Nazareth. In Matthew, they had to escape Herod Archelaus. Like, why work so hard to get the family back to Nazareth? Like, why is Nazareth necessary in Matthew and Luke at all? Why didn't you say he was born? But if, you may, if you're inventing somebody who is a Car Casper the Friendly Ghost, who's Superman, more accurately— then why do you need Nazareth for? So the fiction, strangely, that we find in Matthew and Luke of the family having to have a baby in Bethlehem in very different ways, but somehow get back to Nazareth somehow, indicates that there was someone who came from Nazareth and they're stuck with the Nazareth part and the Bethlehem part is the fiction and the the lies, this is counterintuitive, but the convoluted methods in which Matthew and Luke has the family ultimately going to Nazareth with baby Jesus somehow, that indicates, that points to, that's consistent with an actual historical figure. So in my view, that's why I think there is more light. This is in, in, in the humanities and areas of history, we're never saying I know, we, but all of what I've shared with you would be consistent with some historical person who did not invent Christianity, but that religion was created after his death. And Paul, no question, is responsible for the proliferation of the Christian religion. Thank you for your question. If you enjoyed this program, Please like and subscribe. Adonola, 
אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה 